Okay, um, hello everyone. And uh, my name is Cliff Jolliffe, and over there, the one with hair, <laughs> is uh, Matt Price. And we both work for uh, Physique Instrumente, um, PI, the short name. So um, typically I refer to it as PI. And uh, today we're giving a, a, a talk and hopefully a bit of a discussion about our grand title, Generating Precise AB Quadrature Signals from Motion Platforms Without Inherent Digital Feedback. A mouthful. Okay, let's press the button. So um, th this is the agenda today. Um, I'm not gonna read it all out, but uh, uh, we'll start off with a little bit about the brief history and uh, we'll go through some of the introductions to some of the devices that we find in um, uh, motion systems and th then we're going to discuss an application where essentially we wanted to take some of the advantages of uh, feedback systems uh, that didn't give us a digital output that we needed for an application and, and Matt's going to go through the clever stuff and um, at the end, we'll, if you've got any questions, and maybe we might have some answers, but uh, let, let's see how it goes. So starting with history and some fundamentals of feedback control. Um, so Matt thought it'd be quite amusing because I'm the older one. Um, <laughs> and because I'm British, maybe I knew a little bit more about history than him as, a, as, as an American. <laughs> but anyway, so um, if we look at feedback control, it's actually documented as early as the third century. So in Alexander in um, Egypt, um, when the Romans were there, uh, there was a, a water clock. And essentially the water clock was able to keep ta time by regulating um, the water flow. And so uh, it's what we would consider as one of the first documented evidence of a uh, feedback system. And then um, even earlier, in the first century Roman Egypt, uh, there was a, 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 a crude invention of a, a steam engine, a steam turbine. And uh, eventually, when the British decided to have an industrial revolution in the late 1700s, there was a need for um, constant speed operation of steam engines. And uh, a very clever uh, a Dutch inventor called Christian uh, Huygens, or Huygens, um, who also invented the pendulum on, on a clock. Um, he had an idea that um, James Watt, a Brit, well actually a Scots, but if you know about English people, if it's a Scottish person we call them British, and if it's an English person we call them English. Um, well, he invented what we call the Watt flyball regulator, and if I press the right button, there's a, there's a picture up here, but essentially the steam engine um, was, was driving the shaft and uh, it, we, there was a set point of the, um, uh, the set point was set here for what speed the engine needed to run at. So you could basically adjust this screw up and down and uh, this essentially drove this, this cantilever arm by, as, a, as the uh, turbine or the drive shaft sped up, this uh, centrifugal force would push the two balls out and the scissor action would essentially bring this down and, uh, and essentially when it was going too fast because it's connected here it would actually uh, essentially restrict a butterfly valve and that would actually slow it down and essentially you had this effect of this, this um, part here going up and down to, to regulate the speed. Um, now the clever thing about this, or the thing with introduction to feedback system, is actually, though it was controlling uh, velocity, it was actually um, also controlling the position here. And you also were able to, uh, to set a point the, the, uh, of the velocity by uh, adjusting here. So essentially this was the command into the system, uh, and we could control both position and velocity. And this obviously is a very, very, early example or a very simple example of proportional control in the PID loop. Now um, Matt's the artistic one <laughs> and he stuck this up here. So what is that part? Yeah, so I think this is quite interesting and maybe to expand on what Cliff said in fundamental physics classes, 
you'll spin or they give demonstrations of rotational inertia with arms or uh, fit using examples of figure skaters. And the figure skaters bring in their arms to um, increase their angular acceleration by reducing their inertia. And so this thing here is actually quite interesting. Um, these fly ball regulators are on popcorn machines at Disneyland. So if you take your kids, you can point this out and, uh, and be entertaining to them. Okay, so let's have a look at um, a, a very, very basic system that we come across, um, which is using the, uh, positional feedback. And um, essentially, there are, um, this is a, a motorized stage that we make. And you can see this is the carriage um, and some bearing rails here. And it's, it's driven by a screw, um, a ball screw in this case. And uh, in this case, we put um, the feedback, a rotary encoder, which is measuring essentially the angular position of the, um, of the motor. Uh, and so this is connected to the control system and essentially we drive back uh, the carriage back and forth. Um, but there's actually a, an, an issue here. Oh, it can be an issue. It, this works typically very, very well, but you're measuring here and not here. So your, um, your workpiece, the device under test, um, the tool could, is, is measured here. So if there's any, say, what we say in English, I don't know if it translates, Matt, tell me, Matt, if the <laughs> sloppiness, yeah? yeah? If there's this sloppiness, whoops, go back. Um, if there's sloppiness in the, in the system or hysteresis, backlash, um, if there's uh, lots of back and forth motion, um, you can get a disconnect of where this is measuring and uh, essentially where the carriage is. Um, so this is totally uh, affected by the stiffness of the system and the dynamics of the system. So um, what you could do instead is essentially put uh, a feedback here, this other blue element. Um, so what you're doing now is you're measuring at the point of interest. Uh, and for a ball screw uh, linear stage, we tend to use a linear encoder. Um, and this gives us the advantage that we're essentially measuring directly at the carriage. So it has the, the, the ability to be a, a much more uh, accurate feedback system. Now, when you have um, two encoders in the system, we refer to this as a, as a dual loop. Um, whoops, <laughs> it's sensitive this. Um, yeah. So um, it needs two encoder inputs in, onto the controller. So essentially, because we need two inputs, we're making the control system a little bit more complicated. Potentially, we're adding cost, et cetera. So there, it, there are uh, things you need to consider. Um, but one of the, the really uh, important things is that you have to make sure that the um, resolution on the, of the system uh, with the back encoder is actually uh, equal or better than the, the feedback system here, because essentially this becomes the velocity loop and this is the position loop. Um, so it's, again, you have to be really careful because you can run into problems. Um, and the whole principle could be applied to a rotary stage. And this is a rotary stage here, which is showing the two encoders um, and there's a, a gearing mechanism in here. Um, and then the other thing that we come across is uh, linear stages, which are driven by um, linear motors. Here you have one advantage is that typically you just need one encoder, uh, a linear encoder, because the um, motor is driving directly the carriage. Um, Matt, what, what the hell are these? This, this novel <laughs> picture you drew up here. Yeah, so it's interesting. Encoders have different protocols. In the upper left, you have a square wave or what might uh, mimic a quadrature, uh, A quad B. Uh, our AQB, as we note here in the presentation, are for incremental and other uh, protocols, sine, cosine. And this goes into a part of uh, what we're talking about and limitations and advantages, especially when you need to synchronize external devices to motion systems. It's probably an obvious thing to say, but for example, um, what you mount would be uh, the encoder at the load. So what you're actually measuring would be up here, basically on the stage with the linear encoder. So it tends to be the more preferred uh, option for precision applications. So um, essentially as, as a motion control uh, manufacturer, uh, we, we tend to use two different types of uh, encoder types. Um, incremental and absolute are two common terms that, uh, that we um, hear about. So um, well, what's, what's the difference between the two? 
um, well, essentially uh, an incremental encoder. Um, it, it measures essentially differences in the, so in the distances in the grating. So this is, um, there's two parts to the encoder. There's the scale um, and then there's the read head. And this, the scale here um, for an incremental encoder has equally spaced um, lines and the uh, read head is able to direct a, a light onto it, bounce it back and then convert that, uh, it, that, that uh, line into a, an electrical signal and it essentially counts up or down. Um, whereas if we look at a, an absolute encoder, it's a lot more complicated and actually what you have is uh, a, a unique, like a barcode, it's like unique um, individual uh, position markings. Um, and one of the key differences between the two is that um, incremental encoders are uh, it constantly reading. So the, um, the control system is being fed the information constantly. Whereas on an absolute, the control system has, the control system has to request the position. So it's essentially um, an on-demand system. Um, and we also see a difference um, in the uh, encoder protocol. So for incrementals, it's then subdivided down into what we see the um, A quad B or the square wave encoder. Um, and for, um, it, for other, another output is a sine cosine or amplified sine is another expression that we hear here. And uh, you can see the difference. So this is a cosine signal, as you would expect. It's a, like a sine wave. And, and this is the, the, the digital signal here. Um, and what you do with the, the sine cosine is to get a digital output or an incremental step is you have to use an interpolator which basically chops up the, um, the sine wave into discrete steps and therefore you can get a, an output out. For, um, for absolutes, the, there's a, quite a few different um, protocols that we see. Uh, the two most common that we use are, are BIS-C, which is, um, uh, is, is liked by uh, companies such as Renishaw, and then NDAT is the other one which comes from Heidenhain. So there, there's, but there are others ab about, um, and it really comes down to the control system, essentially, what uh, protocol it can read in. Um, and one sort of really simple way to sort of understand the difference between an incremental and an absolute is that it's essentially a ruler and with the incremental you've got a ruler that's got no number markings on it and uh, an absolute encoder has um, uh, the, the numbers sort of the, on the ruler so you can always see essentially where you are. Matt anything from that from your side on you'd like to add? Uh, good yeah good right okay so question is, is, okay, so you've got the incremental encoders, so um, you've got the choice of A quad B versus sine cosine, and so why, why would you bother to use a sine cosine encoder? Um, well, um, because the A quads, they've been around forever, um, maybe not as long as uh, the, the Hero engine or, or something like that, but uh, um, they're, they're easy, they've got really good noise immunity, um, but one of the, the things that's really attractive about sine cosine is that they um, have the potential for very high resolutions. Um, if you've got more information coming into the system, then, then it's possible to get better control of the position and speed. Yeah? Um, so for high precision motion systems, having using the sine cosine potentially gives you that benefit because you can essentially correct um, uh, look at the information more regularly and, and, and correct it and there's, there's a lot more um, uh, resolution coming in to, and it will give you a higher performance. Um, the other thing that's, that's interesting is um, A quad B encoders, in many cases, they start off as sine cosine and then within the internal read heads on, on, the, on the encoder system, um, it does the interpolation inside. So again, you say, well, I can get high resolutions out, out of the read head that's already interpolating sine and cosine. Um, but what happens is that if you have a really high resolution, 
and you run it at very, very high speeds, there's a potential that you'll, you'll essentially run out of bandwidth on the controller. It can't read the information and you'll start getting information dropouts. So uh, taking the sine cosine directly into a controller gives you the ability to run um, at much higher speeds with much higher resolution. Okay. Now, then we can look and say, well, why would you want to use maybe an absolute versus an incremental coder? Um, because the incrementals have a low latency. They're always um, giving out information. Um, and the absolute, you have to ask for the information. Um, there's also something called low jitter. Um, low jitter is essentially when you're in standstill and how much um, motion that's commanded when, when you actually don't want to, uh, to move. Um, but fortunately now in the, in the control systems, there's some, just a quick bit of work that um, was done by ACS, um, Motion Control, um, and they took a very high resolution um, linear encoder that was a sine cosine. Um, and you can see that um, this is the noise that was coming from the sine cosine, that was essentially affecting jitter. And this is what was coming back from the, the absolutes. Um, but if you can apply some of the new clever controller algorithms to try and minimize jitter, you can get both of them down to a very, very small number. And even though the, uh, the very high resolution AS uh, sine cosine encoder is still giving you a better performance, um, you can see that actually the absolute here is actually um, much better as well. It's lower than uh, what you would normally just get out of the, uh, the encoder. Um, and the other thing about using an absolute, which I think is probably these two things here are actually one of the most important things, is that you don't have to home or reference. So when you power up a, an incremental encoder, it's, it's literally, it's totally blind where it is. And if you could just imagine you had a one metre long stroke stage and you switched it on and the incremental encoder was right at one end of the, the travel, it may have to move all the way to the other end of the travel to hit a reference switch and then uh, move back into, into the middle. Um, so with an absolute, you switch it on and it knows where it is straight away. And there's lots of advantages for that. Uh, one is that you can get your machine up and running faster. Um, it's actually better for safety. Um, you get recovery from crashes is much more safe. If, if you don't know where the other components in the system are relatively, you have to do sometimes quite a complex homing routine to make sure you don't collide. Um, and also, um, absolute encoders can give you the advantage of reduced wiring. And the less wiring you have in the system means it's more reliable. It also, more wiring causes influences on a precision motion system. So there's lots of nice reasons why a machine builder might want to go for an absolute encoder. Um, Matt, anything from your side? No, I think that's, this is good. Yeah, you don't want to say anything about the birds? Oh yeah, and of course, when we go to an absolute versus an incremental encoder, uh, you don't require homing on the absolute <laughs> encoder. These are homing pitches. Right, okay. Um, so what about uh, planned and real motion paths? Well, um, the, the, the planned motion path is really dependent on the, on the motion controller, how it essentially um, generates data. So you could present to your uh, motion controller like a, a path drawing, like a, a, a CAD drawing or something, and then it would interpret that about how it potentially was machining that or the process, um, or if it was doing some sort of inspection. And so the motion controller would do this, this path building. Um, and it may use some um, algorithms um, or how well the controller is, is built um, to give you a, a very, very good motion path or potentially a very, very bad motion path. Um, and essentially, you're trying to uh, generate a theoretical path that is perfect. And this is the motion controller has to try and, and follow this. So you give it a series of set points and then the, the, the motion controller will gen command the, um, the motors or the whatever to try and follow that path. Um, but you always get some sort of um, degree of error. And it, that could be the physical things, things you can't measure directly from the feedback system, but let's assume you can. And then there'll be a deviation between the plan path um, and the actual path. Um, and this is referred to, to the following error. 
Um, and for the precision systems that we, we make, some, sometimes our know, customers are asking us to get down to um, nanometers. Um, so it's all about generating set points in a system and trying to follow that. Um, Matt put his cup on this mug of coffee on here, and I was trying to work out why he'd stuck a picture of a coffee on the, on the mug. Yeah, so this ties back into the original example of set points um, with the flyball governor. Uh, now this is sort of in a modern context where the engine was meant to operate at constant velocity. Here now you're trying to maintain set points that are position related and set points that are position related in time. And this kind of, what that is, this kind of feedback variable uh, that you're using to optimize the process on, uh, one example is sort of, again, coffee. If you, uh, if you heat your coffee, you want it at a particular temperature and you use feedback potentially uh, in this case, if you like cream, uh, the color. And sort of, it's sort of a very similar thing in concept and sort of taking that early industrial revolution example and making it modernized. This is sort of the connection to that, trying to follow ideal, idealized motion paths using position feedback of the type you see here in the upper right. So we've spoken about feedback um, and feedback typically is needed by a motion control system to try and minimize this following error, uh, saying where you are, and then telling the, and then the control system will try and correct it. Now, um, closed loop operation of a positioning device, um, sometimes the feedback is not only um, needed by the motion control system closing the loop for the uh, trajectory or the, or the motion path, it's often required by external devices, and these external devices um, need to be synchronized with the motion um, to essentially trigger um, some external device. And these could be things like lasers, cameras, dispensers. Um, and what we find still is that most of the synchronization, it requires um, a, an AB uh, quadrature signal yeah um, so, or, or the or the raw encoder information is fed through so um, what what we try to end up doing is basically chopping the feedback cable and um, which is always a disaster and you, you try and split it and it just becomes very very messy um, but the other thing that happens is that you essentially um, <sighs> The other things you might want to be using, like a sine cosine um, encoder, um, even though you can get really high resolutions, most of these uh, quadrature inputs can only really accept the fundamental frequency of, of the encoder. So essentially, let's say, for example, we have a, a, a 20 micron uh, pitch encoder. Um, the best you're probably going to get out of that is a, a division by four, so at five microns. Um, whereas your control system might be reading information at nanometer level. So um, it's a problem when we want to use a sine cosine encoder for the, the, the motion system. Um, it's even worse when we start looking at um, absolute encoders because, because they're on demand. So the external device has no way of telling the, the encoder system that it wants um, information and then the information that's passed back is in serial form, which it is very, 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 very likely not been uh, able to read. So, um, when would you want to use um, this information? Well, we need in in cases um, trigger um, during certain motion phases, such as when the system has a as a, as a constant velocity to say that it's finished and accelerating. That that's one of the oldest requirements of a of an external device to know when it's at constant velocity. Um, or it could be a continuous pulse. So if it's say like a glue laying application, you would want to basically pulse the um, the, the dispenser at regular intervals. And if the motion control system was, say, for example, slowing down to maintain accuracy around a corner, if you had a, a system that just continuously pulsed and didn't take information, you'd end up applying too much glue around the corner and having a bit of a mess. Um, and then it obviously gets much more advanced. This is a lithography uh, process, and you can see here 
um, that if it was doing a raster, um, during here we've got um, switch off. Actually, Matt, you're, you're better talking at this because this is one of your projects, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah that's right. So specifically, this particular um, image that you're seeing is a laser direct write application uh, at micron scale resolution. Um, one of the things you would look for is here the consistency of the trigger stop and start. And I think more in the broader context uh, of what we're talking about for set points and following, you have internal encoder information used to close a loop on position, but that's not the full extent typically of what's required in applications like this one, where you need that encoder signal or uh, synchronized um, trigger signals with that encoder information to tell a line scan camera or a laser, um, whether it be pulsed or in this case, this was a CW laser being turned off and on. Um, you require, it's sort of twofold. One is for closing the loop uh, on the system to get it to follow set points. The other is to have it synchronized with a device that you want to do something with. And that's where encoders are serving two functions and uh, how they work in cases like this where you want constant dose and consistency of on and off trigger signals. Okay, we'll just switch to the, probably the more interesting part of the conversation. But um, so um, this this requirement of having a, a, a hardware-based digital quad um, really starts to limit the use of these other encoding methods and, and protocols. So the absolute and sine cosine. I mentioned about the uh, the analog encoders having very high resolution. And then we essentially restrict the, um, the the ability by being limited to the uh, to the pitch of the encoder with the the quadrature. Um, mentioned before about how in, uh, we have to use interpolators um, uh, and splitters to to basically use a sine cosine. It all becomes m messy. Um, and then, as before, we said we a lot of cases you can't even look at absolute encoders so they're just totally restricted so you're getting all these advantages of using absolute encoding for your motion system in terms of safety etc and then you're told you can't use them so this is a this is a real problem but then um so typically the way you look at a motion system is you you're trying to um, spec the equipment based on the performance you need or the price so um if you have a system that doesn't even have encoders or feedback, um, such as stepper motors, because you're trying to minimize cost, uh, again, this can be a, a problem because you, you don't have any feedback to spit out to the, um, to the external devices. It gets even more complicated if you have a non-linear system. So um, this is a hexapod up here. And this hexapod can do wonderful things like move in X, Y, and Z. Uh, and it can also rotate and tip and tilt. Um, if you were just driving it in one direction, you actually end up using um, motion on six legs. And the blue bits here are where the encoders are. So if you want to do a motion across here, how do you get encoder feedback out to the device that you're um, trying to trigger because it's, it's a non-linear relationship between uh, the hexapod and the output motion. Another thing that we come across, and we we're very successful at making uh, gantry systems, not, I don't know if it's not really a great picture, but essentially you have a motor driven here and a motor driven here. So this is, let's say, call it the x-axis. So in this case, you actually have two encoders and two motors. So which one do you use to trigger the output, even if if, even if it is um, an incremental encoder. Um, and with, with the new um, gantry systems, they can actually yaw across. Uh, so even uh, what, what you really want to do is basically have a, a magic or virtual encoder that basically um, outputs essentially where you are in, in the position. Um, so there's many more complex designs which Give, uh, give you problems. And, and a gantry system, we've learned from hard experience that it's always best to use an, uh, an absolute encoder because of the risk of essentially um, this distorting in the, in the cross axis. Matt? So, yeah. yeah, so I think conventionally the use of A quad B encoders um, has been used uh, because this has been the adopted, accepted convention that's been available technologically. 
and the use of those become restricted because, for example, this virtual um, uh, cog axis or center, center of gravity axis that might be formed by two, uh, in, two encoders and an X and X prime kind of setup, um, that would be restricted because there is no, there's two encoder signals that may be absolute and now you can't use an encoder along that axis, which naturally if your tool point, much like in this image where we have a dispensing application, direct ink writing, um, you wouldn't be able to trigger there. You'd have to be triggering off one of these uh, legs of the gantry, one of the arms of the gantry. And so these kinds of restrictions are a part of what guided the development of this new technology we're talking about to avoid uh, the lack of support for absolute encoders, the resolution limitations that come with uh, X4 interpolation on sine cosine when you need an A quad B signal. And uh, that's what kind of guided it because we felt sort of what's available technologically is constrained. And so this is a part of the study um, from that development that became what we'll present on. Switch it off, hopefully it comes back on. Uh, okay, yeah, that's good. Okay, and this is where we make the fancy title called virtual encoders. And if you've looked at rotary encoders, they look something like this. So now the idea is we'll be working with something that's not embedded in the stage uh, in terms of a signal. Uh, where you require that embedded encoder, we're now moving from that domain into something that we'll, we'll call virtual encoders. Um, so we'll give a little background, uh, the practical implementation, and what we did for applications validation. So number one, I think it's important to understand profiling, because again, in the flyball governor, you had a set point, and that set point is not only in a single value over time, it's a changing value over time, more conventionally or typically. So for example, you see here a third order profile uh, right here that gets generated by specifying the velocity acceleration and jerk. And that third order profile gets built uh, from a motion controller. And this goes into the capability of the motion controller. And there's a lot of, I'll say advanced, um, advanced technology and building a profile in a way that's smooth and coordinated and uh, continuous. And uh, in our cases, as tested, that we'll be presenting on, the, um, that profile uh, gets sampled in terms of data. And that data sampling you can see in the blue line, it gets generated in our case at five kilohertz uh, as tested on our motion controllers. So we have 400 samples that are linear, linearly interpolated making that line. And when you want that, you want a piecewise smooth kind of function so that when you're following that, your motion is smooth and these things like dosing or coordinated triggers should be regular and consistent to generate precise results with your synchronized devices. Um, and, uh, and you can see uh, one of the practical limitations of this kind of sampling is in the nonlinear regions on the beginning and end, you have more data where you need it because you're moving in a nonlinear region. And uh, again, the data is so dense by profile building, which I don't think it's considered often, um, that you can have this piecewise kind of smooth uh, function. And much like a car on a road, uh, you want to follow that, that car with your feedback control and use it to synchronize other things. Okay. So uh, for this, uh, the development of that technology that I was talking about is something we call the LCM. The results that I'll be presenting are based on an LCM. And the LCM, this capability was developed to avoid the constraints around use of an A quad B encoder that has to be embedded in the stage. So you might see, or if you're considering working in applications like this, um, that probably by convention it would have been an A quad B encoder, uh, encoded stage physically. And now this, these constraints are lifted with this device. So um, fundamentally, uh, the profile motion becomes the basis for your A quad B. So in our applications where we deal with high precision systems and stages, the following of the stage to the profile can be very, very precise down to nanometers. So relying on that generated profile, the set point, how well it follows dictates the performance of the triggering or the motion synchronized device um, activation or triggering. And so for this, uh, as tested uh, with this device that you're seeing in the upper hand corner, 
We had three axes of coordinated virtual encoder information to trigger from. So we can trigger or we can send uh, the stream of encoder information uh, with three synchronized axes. So now you have your encoder streams uh, talking to whatever device you need, up to three axes on the LCM. There's a new version since this work was done called the laser control interface. Um, and uh, it's moved the capability forward from when we had done this study uh, last year. And uh, to show you here in the bottom, the A quad B generator has a 20 megahertz clock. And that 20 megahertz clock provides 50 nanometers of encoder resolution at one meter per second. It's very, very precise. And in terms of how it's laid out, we have a real, oh, laser's not working. Um, we have a real stage that's providing an internal encoder sine cosine that we don't want to use. We want to use the virtual A quad B signal. Um, so what happens is the sine cosine gets fed to the motion controller. The motion controller gets programmed with the LCM to send the A quad B to, in this demonstration example, a laser. It can be any device. In our study, it was a different additive manufacturing device. And it can send that uh, A quad B, and it can send a coordinated trigger, which we had done. That gets connected to the controller over EtherCAT, which is connected to the PC over TCP IP communicating. And, uh, for our study, as done here, we were monitoring the A quad B signal outputs from um, the virtual encoders that was formed from the sine cosine, according to the profile motion, if that's clear. Okay. So now we want to go into application specific testing, technical observations, and comments. So this um, device was conceived. Um, because it was lacking in the market for doing these kinds of things with precision virtual encoders, um, are working with sine cosine with full resolution, um, are generally uh, on systems that we viewed as constrained. And so we wanted to validate that. It was developed and now it was validated in an application, specifically in added manufacturing, and studied in that particular context. Okay. So for us, uh, this is a PI V741 stage. Uh, by technology, it uses something called an ironless linear motor. Uh, you would typically get really smooth scanning performance from ironless linear motors. This is in the deep end of precision when you run an ironless linear motor. This particular system was used because it's monolithic. It's an XY block, so it provides XY motion. Um, and it has linear encoders with analog encoders, uh, with analog uh, sine cosine encoder signals. So fundamentally, this would have been problematic if the synchronized device required an A quad B because it's a sine cosine. So you can have an interpolator splitter and run that to synchronize your device. But in our case, we wanted to use an LCM and, uh, and validate its performance. So we had two setups. We had one in situ in a system doing added manufacturing. We had another one uh, that was in a test bed in our lab. Uh, what you're seeing here is the V741, and over there is what we call the V408. It's a compact XY stage running an iron core motor uh, with uh, an 80 micron scale pitch encoder. Not quite as precise as this one, but what we were doing, we want to validate in both approaches. Um, to understand set point following or position feedback, uh, this particular stage generally has about 50 nanometers of baseline jitter at the encoder. That's what the position can hold. And uh, that's about plus or minus 20 encoder counts. So for in terms of our encoder resolution using a virtual A quad B signal, we're dealing with about a 50 nanometer baseline, um, even though the native resolution is lower, uh, 1.2 nanometers after uh, our interpolation on the controller. Um, in this case, uh, the microfabrication process required a digital quadrature signal with a max four kilohertz uh, input and a position synchronized trigger. And this is the context that we wanted to test on the LCM uh, in both cases. Okay. So what does this look like? Uh, the LCM is programmable. It's programmable on that 20 megahertz clock. We couldn't run the full 20 megahertz because the receiving device wasn't uh, suitable for that. Um, but at our scan speeds, we were able to start and program for an 80 nanometer resolution. So again, the LCM is programmable uh, by the baseline encoder count. Because it's working from the virtual trajectory with a um, 20 megahertz clock, 
you can have very fine encoder counts, which we used. And uh, in this case, you can see here, um, this setup was tied to an oscilloscope and, and measured, and then it was overlaid. Here you can see on the, this kind of peach colored line, that's the, oh, well, that's the, um, that peach colored line, sort of orange, is the profile motion. And we uh, ran an 80 nanometer uh, single-ended quadrature encoder output back into the controller and overlaid them so that our real reference position that was profiled, are we getting suitable encoder counts that map directly to the, the move? And, uh, and we did. Okay, so it's working exactly as we uh, had planned and anticipated, as conceived. Okay, so uh, just to zoom that in so you all can see, uh, this is one encoder count that you see between the green and the red line. When we measured it here, uh, we were accurate uh, by virtual encoder count referenced against move profile in this feedback loop to 0.8 nanometers. So that's sort of the accuracy, for lack of a better word, or um, how close we're matching the reference position with the virtually generated encoder. So quite good at, at 0.8 nanometers. And this was a little bit based on a coarse measurement, and it's likely better practically. But this was sufficient for what we were trying to understand. Okay. So uh, in this particular application where we were doing additive manufacturing and the precision level, uh, we had a 10 micron feature, minimum feature size. And we wanted to test it here at different encoder count resolutions with our virtual encoder. So we programmed it to 40 nanometers. This is something that in terms of the sine cosine, you can change interpolation factors, but this is a simple programming step. So it's just a simple program that changes that resolution. Sorry, a simple couple of lines of code, not a full program. Um, so the signal is then wired back to the motion controller. We observed it and what you see now uh, by the data density on a move is now 40 nanometer encoder. So effectively what we've done is we've output that virtual encoder stream, programmed it for 40 nanometers resolution, um, and mapped it against uh, reference position, the profile motion, and validated that it's uh, doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing on the V408 and simultaneously on the V741 in situ in a, in a fabrication system. Okay. Now as we step here, I was talking about sort of baseline performance of the V408. This is, uh, tends to be on the lower uh, performance scale of what's available at PI. It has a 50, in this, this particular case in the environment it was in, had about plus, 50 nano, plus minus 50 nanometers of jitter um, with a 1.2 nanometer base encoder count. So what you're seeing now uh, in the green and the red is us measuring one encoder count um, from our virtual encoder against uh, our sine-cosine encoder uh, feedback, and then comparing them so we know how much error is in the virtual encoder versus what we're seeing in the sine-cosine that's built into the stage. Again, much like the slide Cliff went over, this, these have linear encoders, they're putting out sine-cosine. We're making up this uh, virtual A quad B signal based on the profile motion. It's trying to follow that motion, so you can see that yellow line there, sort of jittering up and down, plus minus 50 nanometers or so. And uh, now we're measuring at that encount and that count, and what's the physical encoder distance that was traversed in that time we were supposed to get one encoder. And for that, what we found, in the motion, the difference, the differential is 25 nanometers. So for us, the dominant error mode is really properly following error on the, on the profiled motion. And, uh, and what we're seeing is that it's holding within that noise level effectively. Okay. And so finally, what we had done was do, we uh, had the resolution with the high frequency clock to bring uh, the A quad B signal down to 1.2 nanometer counts. And then we applied that to the V741 system, which was used in additive manufacturing with the 10 micron resolution. I don't think this is properly a limit of what's possible with this system, but it performed well in that additive manufacturing or uh, microfabrication process at this resolution. So finally, just to summarize uh, our findings and some technical comments from the development of this product and its first test in an additive manufacturing application at PI. Um, uh, it's generally believed the 20 megahertz clock can support resolution at speed that's sufficient uh, for 
the majority of applications that we typically manage. Uh, the profile motion as a virtual encoder source performs very well down to the dominant error mode of following error. So in our cases, our uh, systems and stages um, typically follow their motion profiles pretty tightly down to nanometers, potentially up to a micron, depending. And, uh, and uh, that virtual encoder maps to that physical encoder uh, well enough to be used in high resolution applications of microfabrication um, using, again, here in this setup, our V741. Uh, to produce 10 micron additive features in, uh, in uh, essentially full designs with uh, good results. And uh, to give you an idea just of what 10 microns looks like by microfabrication, it's always nice to know scale. This is a 10 micron bar in an SEM image of a, of a, a pollen grain. And that's it. Any questions? Yeah, that, is, is it an EtherCAT device? It is, yeah. Bus? Yeah. Other, other drives that are EtherCAT supporting? Yeah, exactly. For um, number one, you're right. Yeah, it's an EtherCAT device. Uh, number two, in terms of operating, uh, we've it's manufactured by ACS, which is a motion control group owned by PI. And uh, so far, we've only used it and tested it on an ACS EtherCAT network. I mean, the, the EtherCAT network could have other things like back off or IO or drives, but um, it would work as long as uh, I expect with the motion controller being ACS, uh, an ACS motion controller in your EtherCAT network. Yeah, there, there is a, a potential mode. It, it, oh. So um, there's a, a motion controller, which is a slave and that slave could sit on something like a back yeah, off for or sure. another yeah, yeah. EtherCAT network, and so you yeah. would be able to get access to it. The, the sort of the downside, if it's downside, because you get very high performance. So what our customers do, if they want, I, I don't know which EtherCAT mm -hmm. system you might use, but um, if they have their standard EtherCAT network that's running a lot of the machine, because the I.O. is probably better priced, uh, there's other axes that don't need the really high ends that's all controlled on, on, on part of the network and then there's a sub EtherCAT network that sits below that can still be commanded from the from yeah. the master system and this could definitely sit on on that so you yeah. could have access to the uh, the LCM or the new LCI it from another EtherCAT system but yeah. th there has to be sort of like a, a node in the middle of it that's just handling yeah. it, the thing of it is how you program it the language is is n not standard EtherCAT or the back off controller wouldn't have a G code or an M code, but you could write an M code G code or an M code on, say, the PLC system that that would transfer to the lower down into the subsystem. And yeah. so, yeah, I would say and there is. It's not simply you plug it straight into the stat, the, the, the the top end EtherCAT network, but yeah, you can get access to it. Yeah, yeah. and there's no like Cliff was saying just to uh, add to that. There's no constraint on the motion controller being the master or the slave in the network. There's two different controllers that can serve both as your master or your slave. I wouldn't want to imply that only master is required. Yeah, and that of course that's downstream on the EtherCAT network. The LCM would be. Any other questions? Hey, of the people in the audience, has um, have any of you heard of the LCM? Are you aware of this device? Yes. At least some. Okay. A part of our hope was to show the advantages, especially when you don't have inherent feedback, that you can still use an LCM and get process synchronization with a laser, a camera, a dispenser. Um, and some of the advantages that come with that, because now you don't need to use an A quad B encoded system. And uh, yeah, you could use absolute encoders, no encoders, uh, virtual axes. Um, yeah, we found it to work quite well. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you.